Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here and to be the, the first global policy chair and to have the opportunity to talk with you um, and to engage more closely with uh, colleagues here, of uh, distinguished colleagues here um, with whom we have mutual interests. I very much look forward to your comments and especially how you see my framework fitting into the venues that you are familiar with and that, and that you study. I begin uh, tonight in the Anglo-Saxon world. Recently, former President Bill Clinton and aspiring President Hillary Clinton have been accused of mixing philanthropy and business with foreign policy decision making. Tony Blair is accused of similar activity. In the coverage of these controversies, Blair and Clinton are viewed as isolated players. This evening, I argue that these former statesmen exemplify a larger pattern of how today's influence elites operate. They've soaked up the zeitgeist and embraced a societal cultural shift towards informality and flexibility, two bywords of our era. Their influencing practices are legal. They're not necessarily corrupt or unethical, and in some cases, they may be the only way that business can be, can be accomplished. But these means and those who use them are less visible and more difficult to detect than those of their forebears in living memory. Unaccountability is part of their engine. It allows them to bend the rules as far as possible, making it nearly impossible for outsiders to find activity that's blatantly illegal. So investigative journalists can spend years unearthing it. We, the public, face an information problem. And the way influence elites today are organized and the modus operandi they employ enable them to evade public accountability the hallmark of a democratic society. More and more unaccountability and unaccountable modus operandi of elites seems to be just the way things are done. And more and more, I'm seeing the same patterns and lack of accountability among influence elites that I saw in Eastern Europe as an, ins an, as an aspiring social anthropologist in communist Poland under martial law in the 1980s. I was five at the time. So today I'll address these questions. One is structured unaccountability. Two, how do today's influence elites differ from those of the recent past, differ from those of living memory? Three, how do influence elites operate? And how does their modus operandi render them unaccountable and challenge democracy? And finally, how should we study them? Let's turn to one. How is unaccountability structured into the organizations upon which we daily rely, be they corporate or government? I began to grasp structured unaccountability, not just through research and theory, but when it actually threatened my own finances. When I tried to refinance my home, a mortgage lender told me that my otherwise stellar credit history, which I hoped would win me a favorable um, interest rate, had been ruined by an overdue Bank of America credit card balance, of which I was completely unaware. When I'd canceled or thought I canceled my, bank of, uh, my card, Bank of America told me I had a zero balance. I had a cancellation number and the ID number of the customer service representative I talked with to prove it. So I thought, things would, I thought it would be easy to straighten things out. Thus began 20 plus hours on the phone with at least 20 Bank of America representatives. I proceeded from Derek and Dina in customer service in Southern California, to John, a customer service supervisor, to Philippe in the privacy source department in, well, he wasn't authorized to say, to Carolyn in the credit department, a totally different phone number, to Elsa in the credit department, or was it card services, to Adam in Credit Protection, Omaha, to Julia in External cu Customer Relations, to Delia in the Escalations Department, the name of which alone tells you something, 
to Sophia, also in escalations, and Carol in credit analysis in Ohio. Back to customer services, Dan and then Heather in card services, Kenton in the credit department, Susan in online banking and deposits in South Carolina, and sandwiched somewhere in there, Jim, a manager at a call center. Where's Jim? There we go. My journey and an entire notepad scribbled with notes and names and dates to prove it transported me back to an unlikely place, communist Poland in the early 1980s. I recalled six hours I spent on hold one afternoon waiting to place an international call. Was I now up against the same kind of behemoth? The sense of helplessness, the frustration and mounting anger, it sure felt the same. And did I mention that the charge that wrecked such havoc was a $13.69 bill that was for a credit protection plan? That is, the package that I bought to protect my credit is actually what upended it. Exasperated, I tried to fix my problem the old-fashioned way, hoping to appeal face-to-face -to, -face to a physically present person. I walked into a local Bank of America branch. I was greeted by Charles. We were joined by Rob, who called in Bob, the bank manager. All were sympathetic and eager to help. But what could they do? Anybody know? Only get on the phone and call into that same phone tree. So through this maze, I saw firsthand how many organizations now immunize themselves from accountability, leading anyone, leaving anyone subject to their organization, in, case, in this case, me, helpless. And let me point out that in communist Poland, with its quintessential, big, bad, stereotypical bureaucracy, I could have solved such a problem, eventually, by doing what? Paying a bribe. In the old world, say of 25, 30 years ago, it was easier to identify who was in charge. In this new world, interactions of the digital age have disconnected the official or bureaucrat from the client in ways never before possible. We have moved away from the bureaucracy outlined by sociologist Max Weber, where the bureaucrat, however inept, however incompetent, is responsible nonetheless to the client. And with the bulk of technological expertise and data in the hands of big government and corporations, the system can reach out and touch you, but you can't it. As I found with Bank of America, it's nearly impossible to find out who had the power to fix my problem. Bureaucracy is organized into silos and information universes with bits and bytes of information separated from each other and treading in a sea of digital routines. In the Bank of America example, Carol in credit analysis in Ohio had never heard of the bank unit that assigned me cancellation numbers and station numbers. Her boss had never heard of them either. The people working in such silos are incentivized to have a stake only in their own cubicles, not in the larger outcome for the client, let alone the public. Carol is no doubt evaluated by how well she performs the checklist in her silo before passing me on to the next person. And can I help you with anything else today? Accountability, accountability has been reduced to tick boxes and metrics and to performing, performing for the auditor, whether it's an employer, a rating agency, or our donors and funders. And it's been removed from larger institutional knowledge and ethics. Carol in Ohio isn't the only siloized bureaucrat ruled by a checklist. Think banking in the run-up to the 2008 financial crisis. The banker repackaging mortgages and selling them is focused on clicking off the number of deals closed, his eye on a bonus with little stake in the eventual outcome of the deal, even for his client, let alone society. 
Sociologists and anthropologists of finance have argued that this kind of siloization and splintering of information facilitated the financial meltdown. In fact, it was sociologists, uh, a Swiss and German team, who coined the term structured unaccountability after the crisis to describe how banks trading in exotic derivatives were organized. Just months after my odyssey with Bank of America, its CEO faced protests for years of shoddy lending and bad service as people struggled to refinance their mortgages. His response, you can call us and we'll figure it out. He urged people to try calling the toll-free number, eliciting laughter. Accountability has been structured out of the system to such a degree that even the CEO was able quite conveniently to claim that he was as helpless as the rest of us. Deniability is the great new perk of power. Welcome to the 21st century, the world of 21st century influence elites where the buck stops nowhere. This new system centers on unaccountability, structured unaccountability, and it's systemic. Let's move now from the structured unaccountability of corporate and government entities to point two. How today's influence elites differ from those of the recent past. I argue that the way elites organize influence today, their modus operandi, departs from the Weberian model of fixed ordered hierarchies, which was further elaborated by Weber's student Robert Michaels, um, and then further developed by C. Wright Mills, who emerged as the, the past century's most influential elite theorist. The power elites Mills theorized 60 years ago were firmly planted in Weber's hierarchies and the dominance and stability of the nation state system as well. Government officials, military leaders, and corporate executives, he contended, controlled major political and social decisions in the United States. Mills' power elite model rests on command and control top-down hierarchy. Power is largely wielded through bureaucrats with executive authority. Hierarchies are distinct and relationships are stable. Very important. But today's elites have morphed away from these structural positions. Today's system deploys both institution and network-based forms of power. Network-based power derives from players' positions in informal networks and links to organizations and venues that much more than in the past connect elites across a global plane. Elites serve as the connectors. Influence elites themselves have become pillars of power, albeit mobile, flexible, and global in reach. Their ability to connect the dots and to blend in a blur official and private boundaries is in fact a big source of their power. Now, how does structured unaccountability of corporate and government organizations, how does that relate to the way in which today's influence elites operates? I argue that the fact that big organizations are so siloized helps create the need for the very players who can rise above the silos of major corporate and government organizations. The silos wrought by structured unaccountability and these players connect the dots. Influence elites have evolved to fill this very need. And many more dots there are to be connected than in the recent past. Governing and policy making bodies are diversified and dispersed. C consulting firms daily stand in for government. And there's been a proliferation of entities like think tanks and grassroots organizations set up by billionaires or elites or corporations with an agenda. All this is due to a seismic change over the past several, dec past several decades wrought by several transformational developments. Financialization, privatization, the dispersion of global authority with the end of the Cold War, and of course digital technology. Now let's move to number three. How do influence elites operate? And how does their modus operandi render them 
unaccountable, and challenged democracy. I offer four characteristics of today's influence elites. The first is informality. Influence elites have gone informal, off the grid. While just a few decades ago, power rested more in discernible, rule-bound bodies, today, on the world stage, policy ranging from finance to media to technology are framed, sometimes even forged, outside the bureaucracies of governments, international organizations, and companies. Case in point is the Group of 30, the Consultative Group on International Economic and Monetary Affairs. Its list of members reads like a who -who, who's who of those who helped shape the global economy. A political scientist who studied the group describes it as part think tank, part interest group, and part club of actors who write the rules. And its executive director told me, we don't make policy, but you can see our recommendations ending up in policy. One example is the hugely controversial issue of derivatives trading, recommendations about which the G30 crafted in the 1990s with the help of um, a banker from J.P. Morgan. A second feature of the modus operandi of today's influence elites is flexibility. Players provide, perform a plethora of professional roles Here's an influence elite with multiple roles symbolized by these multiple cards. Think tanker, business consultant, media pundit, member of government advisory board, you name it. Now, there's nothing inherently corrupt or unethical about having multiple professional roles. Many of you, if not most of, most of us working in the public policy arena do just that. The potential problem is when these roles overlap and there's an information deficit about what the actors are doing and what their true agenda is due to that overlap. So some of these roles overlap and it's difficult to tell where one role ends and another begins. Players today assume more roles in more venues with more flexibility and movement within a shorter time frame. The way influence is wielded has changed so much that we need to revise our old image of the revolving door. That model has only one exit point, and like for instance, an ex-regulator joining a bank, the ex-member of parliament or ex-minister joining a law lobbying firm. And of course, the revolving door still exists in spade, spades, but a more avant-garde revolving door Today's revolving door features multiple entry and exit points with four or five more options. A player exits to a business role, a think tank role, a government consultancy role, an academic role, a media role, and straddles two or more at the same time. The big players often operate exactly like that. Not only has the the structure or the organization, as I would say as a social anthropologist, the organization of influencing changed, so has the, the culture and what is deemed acceptable. In the old world, it would have been unthinkable for former leaders of the free world to use the prestige of their former office to create a highly lucrative and influential brand. Emphasis on the word brand. In the new world, Bill Clinton and Tony Blair merge philanthropy pol policy and business, and the boundaries are either not there or they shift conveniently. And this brings us to a third characteristic of the modus operandi of today's, today's elites, which is that they set up and use vehicles of influence to help organize their sway in policy and public opinion. And at least three scholars on, um, at this university have done substantial, important work looking at precisely how influence elites use think tanks or use so-called grass organizations that are in fact funded um, and perked by, by companies um, or billionaires. So Anna Gilmore, who studies the tobacco industry, Piotr Ozeransky, who, who looks at 
um, the medical field, um, and David Miller, who's looked at uh, think tanks and, and how uh, the, the networks of think tanks that, that, that are being set up. Um, while these kinds of entities aren't usually included in the framework of political influence, they should be. They've become a crucial, op a crucial part of the operations of today's influence elite. Blair, for instance, has created what's, what's been dubbed Blair Inc., which the tele Telegraph describes as a confusing mix of business, politics, and philanthropy that's administered by a complex system of companies. Blair Inc. features a wide array. There's been the Gov African Governance Initiative, the Tony Blair, uh, Blair Faith Foundation, the Tony Blair Sports Foundation, and the initiative called Breaking the Climate Deadlock, and of course, Tony Blair Associates. Blair has advised Wall Street banks, European insurers, the government of Kazakhstan, among others, and even that of the uh, late Muammar Gaddafi of Libya. And here's, here's, here's one of the overlaps. While counseling Gaddafi, apparently on deals that J.P. Morgan wanted, he also served as an advisor to J.P. Morgan and, an additional, and additionally as an official peace envoy to the Middle East. As you can see from the entities of Blair Inc., vehicles of elite influence can take several, several forms. One is philanthropies. Bill Clinton, after leaving office, in addition to creating the Clinton Foundation and its global initiative, has served as a paid advisor to a global private equity and consulting firm, among other business adventures, ventures. His close aide recruited philanthropic donors to be clients, and as the New York Times put it, some Clinton aides and foundation employees began to wonder where the foundation ended and the biz business began. And think of the potential boundary issues represented by that band of gold. Many think tanks, too, are set up to be or have parts that are used as entities of, of influence across, across the globe. With a scholarly veneer and downsized journalists at the ready, think tanks are the perfect vehicles of influence elites. And full disclosure here, I've been affiliated with one. Think tanks have proliferated since the end of the, of the Cold War around the world, but they, and they've changed in nature. Traditionally, think tanks conducted serious, even multi-year studies. But today, many operate as partisan fighters, influencing policy with rapid response teams and timely messaging. Even well-established think tanks like the Brookings Institution now take su substantial donations from foreign governments, including some with tarnished reputations, and it isn't often disclosed even on the website. Now let's take a look at a Washington power clique, what's been called the Coindonistas. COIN stands for counterinsurgency, a collection of generals, including General David Petraeus, reporters, scholars, and defense contractors, who played a key role in making, executing, and justifying military policy that configured recent years of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. When the American public and Congress were wary of deploying more troops to Afghanistan, which is a, a key ingredient, deploying troops is a key ingredient of coin strategy, the clique set out to sell the strategy to policymakers. They set up and used a think tank to help. Official players who were part of the clique, notably Generals Petraeus and McChrystal, used unofficial channels to press their strategies. They did an end run around the bureaucracy using as a vehicle, their, using as a vehicle their think tank called the Center for a New American Security, which they set up, which of course is substantially funded by defense, defense um, companies. For instance, they released to the public a scathing report on intelligence gathering in Afghanistan through the think tank rather than through the military chain of command and sidelined um, side internal channels. The Coindonistas have as members prominent war reporters who played at least double roles, writing for, say, the New York Times, while also affiliated with and being paid by the think tank. 
Now, this is, this is the, the shadow elite model. Some additionally, at the same time, served as advisors to the generals, accompanying them on, on, on trips and such. The Coindonistas thus swayed public and policymaker opinion to their side, won the fight, and left their colleagues in the military with little choice but to walk with them. This case, in which a power clique makes war policy, stands in stark contrast to, say, the Vietnam War, where U.S. strategy was anchored in the Pentagon and government command posts. Think back to C. Wright Mills and those command posts. In that case, it was sold to the larger establishment and the public by Pentagon policymakers who tried influencing the media to little avail when it became clear that the United States was losing the war. By contrast, the, the Coindonistas sold their plan to policymakers and the public through celebrity generals. Pe Petraeus re reached celebrity status. He was on the cover of, or he was, yeah, on the cover of Time magazine and runner-up for 2007, um, 2007 for Time Person of the Year. He sometimes dodged command posts while embedding himself and his group sometimes dodged command posts while embedding themselves with media and the defense industry um, dependent think tank. With the Coindonistas, points of entree and channels of influence were, mul were, were multiple, overlapping, and obscured, and farther removed from bureaucracies and officials who could be held to account. Right? So there are many more steps um, to the policy-making process, and you, you, it's very difficult to see what's going on in, in, in practice. Consulting firms, too, now often serve as entities of influence. Unlike in the past in which consulting firms engage, engage primarily in private sector work, today they often perform government work. The U.S. government has enlisted private firms to do financial oversight that in the past only the government did. Take, for instance, a firm called Promontory Financial Group. It has nearly 20 offices that span the globe from Toronto and Washington to, uh, Toyo, to to uh, um, Tokyo, Dubai, um, and Sydney. And it served as a private consulting um, entity to banks ranging from Morgan Stanley um, to um, Allied Irish to the Vatican Bank. Promontory is, is hired by these and other firms to manage a crisis or to navigate post-2008 regulations meant to rein in some of the bank's forays into exotic derivatives and proprietary trading. Promontory is staffed largely by former regulators. A former U.S. comptroller of the currency is its head. But my point here is not about the traditional revolving door. When promontory and firms like it are entrusted by government to carry out regulatory functions, they're able to shape outcomes from inside the regulatory process, even as they stand outside the bureaucracy. And that's, that's the point. At the same time that, they're, that, they're, that they can shape it from inside, but they are nevertheless outside, they carry on multiple relationships with the companies they supposedly regulate, and therefore it may not be in their interest to truly regulate. In one example, a troubled firm, MF Global, led by an ex-senator, hired Promontory to ensure that it was complying with the government's edicts. Promontory lent MF Global its seal of approval, saying, MF Global has witnessed a remarkable turnaround in terms of leadership and culture. Yet less than six months thereafter, MF Global collapsed in spectacular fa fashion after making nearly a billion dollars in improper transfers from customer accounts. So did MF Global receive a positive report because it was paying the report's authors? With multiple and potentially overlapping roles, the traditional hierarchical relationship is gone. Instead, these two firms, Promontory and MF Global, the regulator and the supposedly regulated, 
can engage in a dance in which the regulated can take even the lead role. Grassroots organizations, too, can be vehicles of influence. The digital age has sired a surge of what's been called astroturfing, in which companies, billionaires, and politicians mimic a grassroots campaign to get their message across and lead the public to believe that there's a groundswell of support rather than a few, just a very few, self-interested sponsors. I was talking um, earlier today with, um, uh, with, with, with um, Anna about this. The signposts for these new style philanthropies, think tanks, consulting firms, and grassroots organizations include the following. Innocuous sounding names evoking citizens' advocacy or genuine do-it-yourself efforts. So whenever you see an innocuous sounding name invoking citizens' advocacy, you should be suspicious. The use of big names or former top officials to give organizations heft is another. Sponsorship and funding sources that are indirect and almost impossible to track. So this playbook, informality, flexibility, vehicles of influence that I've just mentioned, arm today's influence elites with a powerful weapon, and that weapon is deniability. In fact, as I've shown for several years now, the modus operandi of, of premier elites is so effective and widely utilized precisely because it affords its practitioners deniability. Having overlapping roles aids in deniability. So a power broker, when a power broker is questioned in his role as X, he can always say, well, I was operating in my role as Y. The Clinton Foundation can conveniently argue that Hillary Clinton's decision while Secretary of State to approve a controversial uranium sale to Russia by a mining tycoon had nothing so ever to do with the fact that the tycoon also had a foundation affiliated with the Clinton Foundation. This state of affairs exemplifies why, despite the accountability systems in place, all these checklist systems, true accountability seems in short supply. Those checklist systems, by the way, are for the, for the little guy, not for the big players. True accountability seems in short supply, whether we're talking about corporate and government organizations or major leaders and influencers. Of course, as I said before, what these players do is not necessarily unethical. But there's an information problem. In the information age, there's an information problem. We, the public, can't know what they're up to. They are unaccountable by conventional means. The modus operandi I've outlined can be seen in arenas from healthcare and national security to finance and foreign policy. Take, for instance, the activities of 19 prominent academic economists on the world stage, whose names, many of whose names, you would know. These economists promoted specific financial reform proposals and gave expert advice to public bodies, parliamentary, congressional bodies, and to the media in the run-up to and immediately after the financial crisis, without disclosing their links to private financial institutions. A University of Mass, Massachusetts Amherst study found that the vast majority of the time the economists did not identify their other affiliations and possible conflicts of interest. So what this means is they're testifying before a congressional parliamentary body and they are from Princeton University or Harvard or George Mason, my university, and they don't bother to say, oh, and by the way, I have a big consulting gig with, with Bank of America or J.P. Morgan or, and such. So the information problem, we the public have an information problem. Or consider so-called key opinion leaders or KOLs, and um, Piotr Ozeransky is an expert on KOLs. Pro these are prominent physicians or medical researchers who are paid or perked by pharmaceutical or medical device companies to convince their fellow professionals that a particular company's product is, is the most efficacious. So, KOLs, these key opinion leaders, um, and this is a term used by the pharmaceutical industry, are often heads of medical, they're prominent people, heads of medical schools, editors of medical journals. Um, and 
your or my physician goes to the latest medical conference on problem X, and our physician, we visit our physician who's just come from the conference and has the latest, greatest treatment, and doesn't him or herself realize that the person he was giving the keynote address or a big, um, uh, uh, um, important address at the conference was actually being paid or perked by pharma, that is, was a, a key opinion leader. So again, the information problem. According to a Queen's University study, KOLs, by certain measures, have tripled in the past decade plus. So what's the problem? These experts define the terms of the debates and act as their gatekeepers. We, the public, are led to believe that they're playing on our team when, in fact, they may not be. Again, the information problem. Consider, too, American retired generals and admirals. My shadow, elite, shadow influence project has been given privileged access to two databases, one in, the, one in the military arena, the other in finance, that illustrate these power brokers in action and how unaccountability has grown. So the data that I'll show you today is of retired generals and admirals. A groundbreaking study in, by the Boston Globe amassed a database of nearly 800 retired senior military officers, which my project has added to, and looked at the post-retirement careers of these former public servants. And I've been working with computational social scientists to produce the graphics that I'm going to show you. So what has changed? It used to be that when um, senior military officers retired, they would stop working. They would play with their grandkids or play golf, predominantly. But over the past several decades, they've gone mostly from actual retirement to mostly continued service. Some of them pursue a multi-pronged strategy that affords them money and influence. This net image shows a network of corporations, government entities, and nonprofits that are connected through senior, retired senior officers. As investigations by the Boston Globe and other news outlets have found, some retired officers are paid advisors in military agencies, while at the same time, they're working as consultants to defense and intelligence contractors. Others sit on government advisory boards where they get access to inside um, in privileged information, and they can parlay that information and access to their consultancies with defense companies. And in the past several years, a new pattern has emerged where they, have, they are launching their own startups. So this long-time trend has been accelerated, has been accelerating. So this is how it looked in 1992. Let's look at a 20-year trajectory from 1992 to 2012. So each slide I'm going to show you represents a change of two years. The circles and the dots are people. They're individuals. Lines between the circles and the dots are business relationships between individuals like defense contractors, government advisory boards, um, and so on. These images show, well, let's go through it, 1996, 1998. What's happening here? So these images show how many of these retired officers followed each other into the same firm, started consultancy or venture capital companies together, or served on the same boards. Reflecting on this trend, a U.S. Senator and West Point graduate commented thusly, when I was an officer in the 1970s, most general officers went off to some sunny place and retired. Today, the definition of success, the definition of success is to move on and become successful in the business world. 
Even in the military, where devotion to the institution is supposedly paramount, there's been a shift from institution to self. What does this mean for accountability? In these and other arenas, many power brokers most likely haven't considered the unaccountability inherent in the overlapping roles they craft for themselves. They're mostly not bad apples, but their pattern, patterns of activity leave us, the public, without crucial information, without an easy way to unentangle their roles. How can we know whether the retired generals are more concerned about their companies and their own financial interests or, or those of the nation or taxpayers? We can't know, or at least it's very difficult to know. And we used to have more help from journalism, which has been decimated, investigative reporting in particular. We have to re rely on the few investigative reporters left to unearth some of this. Again, the information problem. Adding to the information problem are digital technologies. Consider the methods employed by A-list firms that take business from unsavory regimes to burnish their images, activity that in the past might have been considered, might have been seen as treasonous. One firm employs, one Washington firm employs all sorts of dark arts, their words, on the internet, editing Wikipedia, Wikipedia entries deemed damaging to their clients, setting up third-party blogs, that's very common, that appear, that appear to be independent, gaming search results to ensure that the positive outweighs the negative. Such efforts sway public perception and mold policy, yet are virtually invisible even to a trained observer. Again, the information problem. And this brings us to the fourth characteristic of the modus operandi of elites, and that is social networks in the form of power cliques. Today's influence elites um, sometimes form power cliques, which are tight-knit, self-propelling, in social network terms, dense, multiplex networks. They employ, they form, they use these networks to achieve mutual agendas. I don't want to take the time to go into much detail here, but I've chronicled the organization and impact of several power cliques. A Washington Wall Street circle that's had a huge impact on the global economy through its decisions about the regulation of exotic derivatives trading. An interlocking political banking and media elite dubbed the locomotives who helped lead Iceland's economy to ruin. And the ultimate power clique, what I call flex nets, an example of which is the neocon core, a dozen or so neoconservatives who helped take the United States to war in Iraq in the early 2000s and had been working toward that goal and and organizing, reorganize the, reorganizing the system to facilitate that goal for many years. Flex nets are a paradox in terms of political influence. They're less transparent than conventional political lobbies and interest groups, and yet they're more coherent and less accountable. Administrations come and go Yet flex nets persist, as they're not the instruments of any particular administration. They have their own power. And even when their members occupy official positions in, the mem in, 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 a, in a particular administration, they are not the instruments of it. They have their own agendas, and they have been setting out to achieve them. Flex nets and power cliques. If there's, this is the take-home point, if there's just one. They test both governments' rules of accountability, right? They're not interested in, in, in democracy or accountability and businesses' codes of competition. They're also not interested, if, 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 if markets are about competition, they're not interested in that either. So they challenge the principles that have, that have defined both modern democratic states and free markets. As someone close to the neocon core told me, there's no conflict of interest. 
because we define the interest. So what does this mean for democracy? There are critiques such as those of Colin Crouch on post-democracy that question the authenticity and legitimacy and of rep representative democracy, that say that democracies don't function in the way we write the narratives. But my analysis attempts to identify the drivers away from democracy by explicating the mechanisms through which today's system operates. So I've outlined four features of the modus operandi of influence elites, informality, flex, uh, flexibility, vehicles of influence, and these self-propelling tight-knit networks, power cliques, flex nets. Finally, my, my last point is how should we study them? We have to focus on the players. We have to focus on the players. Remember, the players don't just operate in the government or the private sector. Their specialty and the source of their influence is in blending and blurring them, right? So if we start with the just, and we only look at one sector or another, we're going to miss the very drivers of influence. So because their very influence comes from their ability to blend and blur boundaries of all kinds, micro, macro, state, private, and to operate under the radar, if we start with these categories, very common in public policy and so on, rather than the players who straddle them, we miss the engines of influence. So the entry point has to be the players. We have to examine also the organizational ecosystem in which the players operate, both, both of structured unaccountability of big government and corporate organizations, and also the, the vehicles and the entities of influence that the players set up and, and use and empower. In short, we have to look at these building blocks and how they fit together. Above all, we have to understand that today's influence elites operate and organize they operate and organize their relationships differently than in the past, and that they operate and organize them to be unaccountable. Thank you.